الحضور الكريم السلام عليكم Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, may the peace and blessings of God be upon you. Allow me to welcome you for the opening of the scientific workshop held by the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies entitled Forced Migration in Arab Countries, where we seek to present a scientific approach of the phenomenon of forced migration that uh, has happened in the last two decades often in the Arab world due to uh, what happened of the post-colonial Arab uh, state. The fall of this Arab state uh, was of great impact. It led to uh, civil strife, sectarianism, militias, the fail of the state. At the heart of all this, the demographic moves of a political uh, side as well as uh, external migration and the right of return, which has led to great and deep changes in the demographic maps of the region and the Levant specifically. If we were to uh, express uh, reservations uh, on the uh, too simplified uh, explanation of this phenomenon, presenting it as uh, presenting us, uh, our peoples, as just ethnicities and tribes that uh, don't have a lot of patriotism. What is sure is that the post-colonial uh, regimes did not build the, the, the pillars of their regimes on a national principle. And then we saw uh, tyranny and despotism as the basis of this regime. This uh, scientific gathering uh, is premised on the fact that the huge movement of uh, migration and forced migration as witnessed by more than one Arab country, according to the latest statistics, there's 71 million refugees and uh, internally displaced people around the world, according to the latest report of the UNHCR. And this is a very updated uh, figure in comparison with the background paper uh, figure of this workshop because we've prepared it before the UNHCR report uh, in June 2019. So 40% of those come from Arab countries, Syria, Iraq, Sudan, Somalia, Yemen, and Libya. So 25 million uh, refugees, including the Palestinians. 41 million are internally displaced people. So these big movements have not been greatly and thoroughly studied. There were a lot of uh, political reports on this that focused on how to deal with this phenomenon and what it led to. And it would only benefit uh, the host countries, the exporting countries, the international organizations. Why? Our Arab Center, through this workshop, wants to contribute uh, to these very few studies that focus on migration and forced migration. When speaking about the failure of the post-colonial state as a, a general framework for the forced migration, we are not going to stop at the reasons or the elements that caused this. We will enter into the heart of the communities of uh, IDPs and refugees, the dynamics of the relationship with their host countries, host communities, uh, the assimilation, the right of return, and all the legal frameworks surrounding all this in reality. The issue of forced migration is one of a, uh, our main topics. It's very vital, it's very active, and we think that it is part of uh, how sci uh, social sciences interact with the community so that they don't remain a luxury and uh, just a, a topic of conversation uh, behind uh, closed doors. The Arab Center may take this as an example uh, to present how social sciences uh, uh, can have a better future in a serious academic way that distinguishes it from other sciences. This will help us distinguish between uh, the 
external aspect of this phenomenon and the more thorough dynamics that it leads to. We will present more than 20 scientific papers in the next two days uh, covering most topics and uh, cases. We will close it with a roundtable that uh, tackles the humanitarian uh, work in areas of migration and forced migration. And we will have a, a book to conclude all this in 2020. And it will be focused on the phenomenon of forced migration in the Arab world. The first session will be about uh, the background of this forced migration it will include four papers and it will uh, continue for two hours until 11 and it will be headed by Dr. Ali Zatari with the participation of the experts he will introduce. Thank you so much. Thank you Dr. Haider for uh, this introduction and our thanks to the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. My name is Ali Zatari. I will be moderating this session and uh, we have in this session four uh, presenters. Dr. Yahya al Kubaisi. he will be uh, discussing forced displacement in the context of identity conflict, the case of Iraq after 2003. Dr. Hassan Al Haj Ali will be talking about Darfur and internal conflict. Dr. Musa Al Yaya he will be talking about uh, Yemen, and it's worth mentioning that uh, Yemen has internally displaced persons, but no refugees. Uh, this is so far as I understand, unless uh, th there is uh, this fact is to be corrected. And Dr. <coughs> Majid Hassan Ali, he will be talking about ethnic and religious minorities in disputed areas of Iraq, the case of Yazidi minorities. I'll give each speaker 20 minutes. Please. Uh, respect the timeline and uh, save as the, uh, the uh, attempt to stop you and interrupt you. Then we will have some time for Q&A session. And please allow me to say, first of all, that uh, Officially speaking, there are 10 Arab countries going through humanitarian crises, whether uh, because of uh, internally displaced persons or refugees outside their borders, or as recipient countries of uh, refugees. And uh, the response is by and large uh, um, spontaneous and momentarily and uh, although in most cases with the passage of time it turns into a long-term process and uh, these countries uh, are trying to cope with the situation taking into account all the political economic and social constraints and uh, also, if we want to have a look at these crises, we will soon discover that the response was not at an integrated regional level as Arab countries working together, but it was more or less at the, the national level. And in tomorrow's round table, we will be discussing this issue even further and some of the proposals or suggestions. This session will be an appetizer for the events of uh, two days, and uh, we hope that the center will uh, have more specialized workshops to elaborate uh, the issues of Sudan, Yemen and other countries and 
we hope that uh, from now on we will see more of a regional attempt to deal with these crises in how to analyze them, how to respond to the needs and to continue the debate. I will start with Dr. Hassan Al-Hajj Ali from Sudan. He will be talking about Darfur internal conflict and forced migration in Sudan. In the name of God, the most merciful, most compassionate, uh, I first of all would like to thank the Center for allowing me the opportunity to discuss this uh, uh, timely topic. I will be focusing on the internal uh, displaced people inside Sudan and inside Darfur in particular, and will not allude to the question of refugees outside the Sudan. The war which was going on in Darfur, Darfur is situated in the west of Sudan. This war had an impact not on the region itself, but the entire country of the Sudan. And uh, some of these uh, uh, aspects of uh, impact uh, was manifested in the and the forced uh, displacement of people in the Darfur region and in Sudan in general. And uh, in this paper, I'll be discussing the different reasons uh, and also added to that uh, elements of uh, drought and uh, as well as armed conflict uh, and uh, because of that, the displacement was bigger and had a bigger impact compared to previous uh, similar cases. There are studies linking the level of violence witnessed by uh, a country and the level of uh, internal displacement. The more the violence became apparent, the more the internal uh, this <coughs> displacement became uh, apparent. Uh, this situation in Darfur continued, uh, in fact, uh, as uh, levels of development were at really low levels in the Darfur. This trend uh, continued uh, through the, during the different phases of uh, the uh, independent post independence and um, ruling systems you see from the diagram this is a graph showing uh, the uh, economic development and human development compared to the income and you'll see that uh, the a number of uh, governorates in the Darfur region which are represented by the lowest level of uh, development. In the literature, there is different definitions of uh, uh, displacement and displaced persons, but maybe there are two main ones, more uh, comprehensive ones. And this alludes to all people who flee areas of drought or armed conflict. Uh, and uh, depending on two reasons, first of all, the displaced person uh, may not try to, may, may not want to link his displacement uh, to, from his original uh, habitat because uh, of fear of the consequences. And the second reason, the displaced person may present the reasons as part of the armed conflict or drought, but he may be an economic migrant, in fact. And we are, we are concerned with people who declare themselves as internally displaced because of uh, natural disaster or because of armed conflict. Darfur has seen waves of displacement uh, 
before the 2002-2003, when the civil war was at its worst, in 1984 to 1985, there was a severe drought which uh, hit the Darfur region and led consequently to the displacement and migration of people to other areas. The table here uh, shows the number of people who have either been impacted uh, actually or were uh, likely to be impacted. Or, uh, in, in August 1984, the number was more than two million. And this actually moved from uh, uh, Kurtuvan and Darfur and uh, and you see the other figures for the same period. <laughs> the waves of drought which hit uh, parts of Sudan, as we know in its recent history, have resulted in the displacement and migration of people from rural areas to the towns and cities, to more urban areas in the hope of improving their situation and uh, overcoming the impact of drought. So I've, in 1984-1985, in um, uh, large people of, la large numbers of people came to Umdurman and settled around it. This map shows the pattern of uh, the people from uh, rural areas, uh, farmers, uh, peasants likely, uh, moving in different but set directions within the country of Sudan. As for the current wave of uh, displacement, which is still going on, we will see that uh, this wave came after the civil war had uh, broken out in 2002, beginning of 2003, and led to thousands of people uh, leaving their area. Some even went outside Sudan to Chad. The number varies according to the uh, how good or bad the security situation is in the region, but on average, the number remains around two million until now, and uh, they are scattered over uh, some refugee camps or displaced people's camps in different areas of the Sudan. According to the International Committee, charged with investigating what the events in Darfur, the internally displaced persons are numbered around 1,650,000 people and some 200,000 in Chad. Uh, international organizations estimate, according to December 2018 figures, that the displaced people in Sudan number over 1.864 million people. This table shows the number of displaced people in Sudan according to the different regions. And we see that displaced people from Darfur is 1.64 a million and from other parts like uh, the, the, the figures are there. This table shows the result of a survey done in the displaced uh, p persons camps first in Darfur in the north, uh, south and uh, central Darfur and west Darfur and the there are camps and there are also groupings of people where people center were, were not officially uh, recognized as uh, displaced people's camps, but some became so later. And we see the number of uh, 
the villages they fled and the number of uh, widows, etc. And uh, in total, there are 46 camps, and the number of concentration points uh, is uh, 68. And the total number of people impacted is just over 2 million. The number of villages impacted are 3,324. Number of widows is 39,815. If we take a look at the displaced persons camps, we'll see most of them have become like uh, almost semi-temporary accommodation. And in some areas like Afas and Yale, they became like residential uh, neighborhoods where these uh, displaced people have settled. And we took the, the Salam uh, displaced uh, camp, which is about two kilometers outside Al Fashir, with an area of five square kilometers, and it houses some 35,000 displaced persons, according to the figures of 2011. This uh, camp, uh, according to 2015, Figures it has thirty uh, f fifty one uh, schools, thirteen uh, elementary schools, three secondary schools, thirteen kindergartens, twenty two Quranic schools, and some three hundred and seventy five teachers uh, teach there. It has some training centers for uh, women. And uh, the other point I would like to mention that uh, relates to displaced people and political activism and violence. The, the displaced persons camps in Darfur have become part and parcel of the political struggle between the government and the armed groups and movements. Uh, the government wants to expedite the return of these displaced people to their houses, uh, whereas the, uh, the political groups want this to be done within uh, more permanent uh, settlements and according to arrangements, political arrangements, uh, within a permanent peace agreement. Uh, for this reason, uh, the, the displaced persons have their own, now their own organizations and the mayors of the areas hosting them and the representatives of political parties each have their own uh, uh, political stance now and want to influence events accordingly. The degree of uh, displaced people engaging in violence uh, depends on the aims and actions of the belligerent parties and uh, also the <coughs> environment in which the displaced people are uh, present. Also, there are four frameworks we can identify here which uh, we can understand the phenomenon through it. There are the camps under the control of the government, uh, second uh, camps under the control of the armed groups, and also uh, whether or not they are in the border areas between two countries. There are important points here. The camps uh, under the control of the government are highly politicized, and the general environment uh, of the struggle in Darfur. And, and there are studies uh, showing that there's a high level of political activism. Secondly, uh, militarization is uh, the dominant aspect of the 
the, the, the camps under the control of the armed groups and the, the camps on the borders between Sudan and Chad are recruiting grounds for uh, fighters and they are used as uh, support uh, bases for the armed groups and the ones in the rural areas they are more random and in desperate need of help more than the others as for the return of displaced persons i would like first of all to mention the doha declaration and the doha document for peace in darfur which was signed in doha and this document in article 51 specifically Uh, recommends the establishment of a commission for the voluntary return and repatriation of uh, the displaced persons and also uh, to provide the basic needs like accommodation and food and uh, also uh, compensation and uh, also uh, compensate people for their losses and development of the impacted areas this commission has in fact uh, 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 prepared the guidelines for each aspect of its work they also uh, prepared uh, application forms for those who want to return on voluntary basis <coughs> this table shows the number of actual people who returned to the villages known now as return villages and between 2014 to 2017 there were 320 such villages villages with 282,000 uh, people in 2018 there were 470 with 326,000 2019 700 and the total number was around 1.47 million As for the compensations, uh, according to Article 43 of the Doha Declaration, uh, the, this uh, document stipulates that uh, the refugees and internally displaced persons and all those impacted by the war in Darfur have the right to, to receive compensation. And there was monies also either... Uh, Uh, promised by donors to contribute to this fund and also the document uh, uh, emphasizes that uh, the displacement has impacted uh, the entire country of Sudan and also in the because of the existence of the diaspora uh, Uh, refugees and uh, displaced persons uh, organizations have come into existence to in, or are engaged in uh, advocacy and uh, supporting their rights and uh, at the same time and as a result of this activism the platforms and the fronts representing the displaced persons has increased and they started really raising the issues concerning the status of these uh, displaced persons and also the United Nations on its part and uh, in collaboration with the African Union and through the UNIMED the peacekeeping force have provided a model that can be repeated in other parts of the world i leave it here and i thank you for your kind attention thank you dr hassan for respecting the time limit allocated to you allow me to give the floor now to dr musa to talk about yemen then we will allocate the last uh, 30 minutes for Iraq uh, from the north to the south and then
Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank the organizers of this very important uh, workshop, especially at this specific time in the Arab world. They say that the worst that uh, men have done is uh, war. Indeed, the horrible uh, implications of war are forced migration, displacement, and uh, horrendous things that people go through in the countries that are going through this. I will speak about an important issue, which is the role of NGOs in providing aid to displaced people in Yemen. You know that Yemen is a forgotten country. It's a humanitarian crisis that is also greatly forgotten, unfortunately. The total number of displaced until now that is officially registered is around 4 million people. We're talking about internally displaced people as per the definition of the United Nations. These are the people that are moving inside uh, the country within the natural borders of a sovereign state. There's 3.5 million people who are displaced in dif different uh, displacement areas. We will speak about them, the challenges they face, and the challenges before the NGOs in providing aid to them or uh, relief to them. At the outset, how the study started uh, from a specific hypothesis in case uh, the state was not present partially or totally, we assume that NGOs, civil society organizations, uh, will fill the, fulfill the role of uh, the state in providing a lot of health and social services to the displaced in order to reduce the impact of displacement. This third sector institutions will play the role of the state. This is the original assumption as per a large number of hypotheses and uh, principles adopted in countries of conflict and wars. The main question of this study was what are the main challenges before the NGOs to provide relief and aid to the IDPs of Yemen? It appears that most studies uh, of importance that uh, focus on NGOs, focus on their role after the war, and many international studies only focus on the role of NGOs immediately after uh, the, uh, the end of the war or post-war. But there's a lot of shortage in the studies that focus on the role of NGOs during the war, be it uh, at an Arab level or global level. In this complicated environment, we find that there are a lot of complications related to NGOs because they would deal with the militias, uh, with different uh, warring parties, so it's a very difficult situation. So this study focuses on highlighting the very complicated situation that the NGOs have to deal with when it comes to Yemen. The main purpose of the study focus on presenting some recommendations to correct uh, the situation in Yemen. There are a lot of special recommendations related to something I've already mentioned, NGOs working during the war or their role during the war. So we have to identify their geographical spo uh, scope of uh, refugees and then the work of the NGOs also in Yemen, as well as identifying the uh, regional, international humanitarian process uh, that uh, uh, provides relief to the refugees in Yemen. There are a lot of theories Uh, there are a lot of NGOs that uh, work on 
this issue, I, I wanted to focus on four elements. The weak uh, capabilities of NGOs when working under uh, conflict. Can you hear me now? Is it working now? Yani why do I have to move? Yani why? In the middle of the translation. <sighs> Can you hear me now? In 2018, there is uh, a large number, as you see on the screen. There is a contradiction. Uh, between the different figures and numbers of NGOs. For example, in the middle of Yemen, you see that the number of IDPs there goes beyond 800,000, while what we see on the table is around 300,000. 
So it's a much lower figure. So there are no data and statistics on the official ones on the current number of IDPs. This is one thing. Most IDPs uh, were in Marib, which is a very oil-rich uh, region in Yemen, and it has a lot of military capabilities. So this is why the IDPs moved or uh, transfer to those areas in order to escape the scourges of war and conflict. Now for the role of NGOs. We have to see how they are disseminated uh, in Yemen as per the map that I have drawn. So you see the different concentrations of uh, NGOs and IDPs. If you look in red, there are the main areas where IDPs live. There's a map above that where you foc where you you see the focus and the concentration of those NGOs. You see that those NGOs are not present where the IDPs are present. So there, here we conclude a main indicator. We see that the NGOs are present where the international organizations are, either in Sana'a or in Eden. So there is no clear geographical uh, distribution of NGOs where the IDPs live in Yemen. This is a very important indication as to the geographical distribution. This study was prepared not only to study the element of uh, displacement, but also other elements. For example, health services, education services, the poverty, lack of education. NGOs should be present in the most de demographically heavy areas or demographically intensive areas but they are present in areas where uh, international uh, NGOs and organizations exist so that they get uh, uh, support, uh, both financial and other. So this is a the, th the sample of research, uh, we have 30 local NGOs from the 1st of July to 30 of uh, August 2019, uh, we've conducted uh, 20 interviews with 20 NGOs uh, personally and 10 phone interviews. For the international NGOs, we had around five, a sample of uh, 10 NGOs, or as a sample of 10 IDPs, north, south, west, and middle of Yemen, as well as the eastern part of Yemen. From the north of Yemen, we took Sana'a, 10 NGOs, uh, knowing that this is a highly refugee-intense area. This is also an area that suffers uh, from a lot, uh, from a great blockade with the Houthis uh, controlling Sana'a, and a uh, blockade being uh, imposed on it. The criteria for the selection of NGOs their proximity to displacement areas geographical distribution as well the type of activities Even though there is uh, more than 15,000 uh, officially registered NGOs, only 500 are currently active in Yemen, and 13, uh, 30 of them were included in our sample. And they are currently working in relief and uh, the combat against poverty. The main results regarding the first dimension, we found that there's a lot of elements 
that hinder the uh, performance of those NGOs. First, they are incapable of providing relief uh, to the IDPs. They don't have enough capabilities. Uh, there are structural imbalances. Uh, we're talking about a one-person uh, NGO, which means that the NGO is led by one person. It doesn't have a good structural uh, or organizational structure. Second uh, reason is a lack of strategic planning because they are linked to the donors. Donors provide them with the financial support on a project basis. After the project, the role of the NGO is done. They don't have a strategic plan to continue to pursue uh, uh, requesting and obtaining financial support and to pursue working with the IDPs. Another element is a lack of coordination and cooperation amongst them. They, you see them uh, com competing against one another to obtain uh, support from the donors, financial support. So every NGO is considered as a competitor to another NGO. They don't coordinate, uh, they, they don't consolidate their efforts to uh, conduct direct relief activities. Now another hindrance is the social culture. Culture doesn't really support the work of NGOs. NGOs say that there's a lack of volunteers. Uh, volunteer work is not promoted enough. It's not adopted and embraced enough. So you don't see a lot of young people just rushing to provide uh, voluntary service to those NGOs as they desperately need. Also, there's a lack of knowledge by NGOs, by the people as well, by their uh, target audience. So uh, this leads to a lack of social monitoring and supervision. So uh, we're talking about around $10 billion in financial aid to Yemen, but uh, we don't see this actually happening on the ground. regardless of who funds these NGOs. So we're talking about $10 billion in financial support, but we ask, where did this huge sum go? If it had truly been used as it should have been, we wouldn't have seen any IDPs anymore. If uh, those big sums were truly conveyed to the IDPs. I'm going to finish soon. Also, uh, you, youth, the youth, the young people are not very eager to join NGOs. The most recent NGOs lack the structure to soldier through the conflicts and the war. This had to do with the first dimension, not the second dimension the risks uh, regarding security and loss of life for the staff. Many NGOs have become targets for the warring parties to polarize them, to dictate uh, how their activities should be in line with the strategic objectives of the warring parties. This is one of the main issues that a lot of NGOs had complained about. There's also the use of extreme violence against those NGOs, its staff, its volunteers. Uh, due to the failed uh, state, anyway, and the lack of capabilities, 70% of NGOs were closed down. 60% of NGOs have been looted have seen their assets frozen, and have seen a lot of violations committed against them. In a direct quote from one of the participants, female participants specifically, in our interviews, she said, the life of NGO workers is now at risk. All their activities are monitored. We're working under warring parties that, have, uh, that use military and intelligence tactics that do not recognize the basic rights. <coughs> they, uh, they practice a lot of abuses, mental, emotional, physical, sexual. They allow themselves to act as they please. 
this is what is happening right now in Yemen. There are a lot of violations uh, against NGOs. Now, the main outcomes of the second dimension, the threat to vi commit violations of human rights is something that NGOs face a lot. They are at a great exposure and risk uh, the warring parties. They are uh, they may be uh, tortured. Uh, they become forced. Uh, they can become disappear. They may be killed and injured. Also, there is a lot of pressure against the NGOs to force them to pay zakat, to pay uh, uh, taxes, even though they are spared from taxes. Sometimes they have to pay 60% of the donor money to the warring parties to protect themselves. This is why international uh, financial aid, uh, Yemen, is now something that warring parties rely upon to extend the war and to prolong it even further. Briefly, many violations are committed vis-a-vis uh, -vis the NGOs. That's for the second dimension. The third dimension, we see that NGOs are divided uh, along the lines of the warring parties. Many of those NGOs that were recently formed, I need two extra minutes if you allow me. I would like to cover everything in the study, just for the sake of Yemen, because it's a forgotten country. Now, for the NGOs. Many of the warring parties have established NGOs. You see 2,000 NGOs founded by uh, Houthi. The same goes for the South Movement, where they have 1,500 NGOs approximately. And you have uh, extremist uh, groups such as Qaeda and other terrorist uh, organizations that also have their NGOs. They all work in the humanitarian relief realm. They attract uh, foreign donor money. And as I mentioned, humanitarian relief money has become a main element and fuel for prolonging the war and the conflict. So we find that warlords are the ones seeking uh, to prolong the war and to continue this commerce of conflict and war to directly benefit from international donor money. The adopted delivery method uh, in Yemen. Those mechanisms even further complicate humanitarian work, uh, further complicate the implications, uh, humanitarian implications of war, as I've mentioned before. The politicized uh, NGOs can reach the areas of the IDPs greatly. Of course, this violates uh, the rules and the laws. Sometimes NGOs work on attracting combatants for the warring, uh, for the sake of warring con uh, parties. Those NGOs are used to uh, add legitimacy to the work of the combatants uh, and to also uh, hone the image of the warring parties. This is the third dimension. Now the fourth dimension. There is a lack of local international mechanisms to deliver relief uh, assistance and protect the IDPs. We see that the regional, uh, so we see that uh, uh, regional parties that are at war inside of Yemen, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, etc., they also use their own NGOs, their own relief funds. Uh, inside of Yemen. There are a lot of NGOs that have to 
work as per the dictations of the donors. Uh, some projects may be very weird, honestly. I'll tell you about one specific project where $600,000 was spent in, uh, in a project for uh, hand washing by sending SMSs uh, uh, to tell people how to wash their hands before they eat, even though people don't have even don't even have food to eat. So who would spend that much money to, to send text messages through phones to, uh, for hygiene practices and hand washing? This is one international NGO work. It's like uh, they're uh, they're so myopic. They don't look beyond this uh, direct need to more general needs, more basic needs. Also, there's a lack of coordination and cooperation, so we see duplication of efforts. We see the same project having been implemented by 10 NGOs, only with a change of title. And the money was obtained. So when we speak about $10 billion, we see that 70% of them are for operational costs. 30% uh, have been going for the warlords in Yemen. Sometimes we may speak about 10% only reaching the IDPs. Donor international uh, NGOs provide assistance to specific uh, parties. As I mentioned, the international staff have left those NGOs, only local uh, staff work with NGOs. And we know that clientelism and nepotism here is uh, king. So we see that a lot of the amounts don't go to the IDPs themselves. They go to establishing a network of interests and benefits. There's also uh, a lack of a clear delivery mechanism, so uh, which leads to the fact that these NGOs may further deepen the division. Sometimes uh, NGOs may provide uh, assistance to the wrong people, to the wrong target audience, and this causes a lot of uh, animosity. So you see them focusing a lot on the IDPs, while the people in the region where the IDPs are located may be even poorer than the IDPs. So this creates a lot of animosity. And feelings of hatred towards the IDPs by the local hosting community. This is something that has to be taken into consideration uh, when it comes to the delivery mechanism uh, of the uh, assistance. Thank you. Now we move to Dr. Yahya and Dr. Majid to discuss the situation in Iraq from south to north and to focus uh, on issues uh, relating to internally displaced persons. Thank you, Chair. The paper I'll be presenting today will be dealing with the forced displacement in the context of identity conflict, especially in the aftermath of 2006. From 2003, 2003 until now, there, is n there were nine waves of uh, forced displacement, uh, all to link to politics. Uh, in, in fact, uh, in fact, from the 50s until now, starting with the Jewish people of Iraq, who represented around 2.6 of the population of Iraq. So the number we're talking about uh, was rather large. 
then the Faili Kurds were forced to uh, force uh, uh, migration, and especially after the Revolutionary Command Council's uh, uh, decree in uh, 1980, whereby uh, tens of thousands of people were forced to leave Iraq because of uh, their uh, Persian affiliation as according to the situation with the Iraqi Nationality Act. And then 700,000 people from the city of Basra as a result of the war of the cities then the Kurds forced displacement in the 1980s and also the population of the marshlands of Iraq in 1991 and then the Kurds at the end of the Gulf War which led to the Security Council resolution of establishing a uh, no-fly zone and um, probably a million and a half Kurds had to leave their areas. Then there was uh, the number of Iraqis who probably 800,000 uh, and then after the 2006, after the events in Samarra and the 2014 wave also. After 2003, as a result of the violence which started early, the first victims of uh, forced uh, displacement were the Palestinians who used to live in Iraq. Uh, according to the figures available, more than 34,000 people, most of them came to Iraq as a result of the 1948 events, they had to leave Iraq forcefully and uh, now the only, only 6,200 or so people remain. And also as a result of the uh, aftermath of the occupation and in the so-called Fallujah War 1, Fallujah War 2, um, in both uh, uh, waves, uh, hundreds of thousands of people were forced to leave, and then as a result of the uh, Al-Mahdi army and American forces confrontation, thousands of uh, the inhabitants of Najaf also led. And uh, in 2006, uh, on the 22nd of February 2006, where the holy shrines of the Askari Imams in Samarra were blown up, uh, we came face to face uh, in, with this uh, displacement in a more forceful manner. When we take what happened in Baghdad and in the province of Diyala, in Baghdad, for example, 69% of the uh, wave of, of displaced people were from the inhabitants of Baghdad. And also uh, over 79% were from Diyala. Now we are talking about two cities with mixed inhabitants, Baghdad or Diyala and this is because of this identity conflict because uh, many armed groups uh, belonging to the Shiites and Sunnis used forced displacement as an, a means of a weapon in their struggles and also the authorities, the government was uh, colluding with them either through keeping silent uh, or uh, actively engaging in the forced displacement. If we uh, take a look at the map of the dis displacements, we'll discover that there was an attempt by the Sunnis and Shias to reach uh, the river Tigris, and there were the mixed centers of population 
which saw the uh, highest level of violence and the biggest waves of uh, displacement. And uh, contrary to the perceived uh, ideas, uh, the large percentage of uh, the displaced people were Shias because uh, they wanted, those who wanted to uh, engage in this kind of ethnic cleansing, especially in the Karkh side of the river Tigris. And uh, after 2006, it was 50% higher than the displacement movement. In Diyala province, there were maps drawn on the ground through the acts of violence engaged in to further this uh, sectarian struggle. Diyala saw two ways between 2006 and 2013 as a result of the Sunni armed groups like Al-Qaeda, and therefore they were the main actors in the forced displacement of the Shiites in Diyala. And the figures of 2006 to 2016 will show that the largest uh, wave of forced displacement was among the Shiites. Then, after that, the, the situation was reversed and after 2017 when the Sunnis were pushed out of their areas to create uh, areas purely belonging to the Shiite uh, sect. For example, if we take the town of Ba'kuba, now, uh, now it's... Uh, Everybody from the other parts of the province of Diyala were pushed into the town of Ba'kuba. The biggest problem is the war against ISIS was uh, exploited to further this aim. And now the war against uh, ISIS uh, was used as a pretext to create uh, these uh, new areas, uh, sectarian areas, after being cleansed uh, from the other sect. If we follow the figures, we will discover that uh, in Baghdad, for example, in the eight months following the the Samara incident, more than half a million people uh, were made to leave their areas. But in the following three years, the numbers increased. In 2007, the number reached 1.4 million. 2008 reached 1.8. I'm talking about uh, displaced people. In 2009, it went down a little bit to 1.7 million. And 2010, after the relative calm, we went down to about 220,000. In the three years following the Samarra incident, there were uh, the, uh, migration with the relatively same numbers outside Iraq, uh, mainly to Syria, and to a lesser extent to Jordan, and in Lebanon, some half a million Lebanon, Turkey, Egypt, uh, and other countries which absorbed these uh, waves of migration. We're talking in general about four million between internally displaced and refugees abroad. The situation after that became more drastic when ISIS uh, started gaining control over Ramadi and Fallujah from uh, uh, January 2014, and the situation got worse when they took control of uh, the city of Mosul and the governorates of Salahuddin and Kirkuk afterwards. 
Then we reached a number for the internal displays at the end of 2017 of 5.6 million. This is more than 1 million families uh, who had to uh, leave their areas and become internally displaced. These are the actually uh, officially documented uh, uh, families because there is another figure which is the unofficial because people who, who are financially better off uh, they made their way directly without uh, putting their names on any any agency or uh, so they found their own accommodation somewhere so maybe the total figure reaches six million and because the situation in Syria at that time was relatively bad and therefore Lebanon, Turkey and Jordan became alternative places <coughs> and because Egypt was not giving visas easily to Iraqis so the map of these people uh, seeking refuge abroad we are talking about internally displaced people inside Iraq is that 4 million? the ones who are officially registered were 5.7 million internally displaced people and officially registered without the f official figures the total will be or the official and unofficial figures will reach 6.5 million and uh, the government's position by the way vis-a-vis -vis this situation was doing absolutely nothing the government did not provide any real support for this large wave of displacement all what was given over a period of six years from 2014 to till 2019 is 2 trillion Iraqi dinars or 1.6 billion dollars only. If we divide this by the accumulated number which reaches 19.2 million, this means that the share of each displaced citizen from the budget of the government was 8.2 dollars a year and this is really gives you an idea when we talk about uh, a country with a budget of uh, more than 100 billion dollars what is even more serious is, is always the aid given to displaced persons was linked to the identity conflict and uh, and uh, whenever the government spoke about uh, providing financial uh, support for the displaced people, they always linked that to financing the popular mobilization militia belonging to the government, or al-hasht al-shaabi as it's known in Arabic. They used to really sometimes deduct 3.6% of government employee salaries to help the displacements and the militias. 60% went to the militias and 40% to the displaced people. So therefore the government has in a completely uh, mysterious way ignored the question of uh, displaced people if we go back to the figures of 2007 when the number reached 1.4 million citizens all the money allocated by the ministry of uh, the displaced and uh, um, migrant people was 800 million dollars out of a government budget of 100 billion dollars. So this shows that the identity 
conflict governed even the government's behavior vis-a-vis -vis these uh, displaced people. Another important point here is uh, the sectarian uh, uh, influence was there to also govern the geography of uh, the movement of the displaced people. For example, the first observation we ought to make is the number of displaced people who entered camps was very limited. Indeed, it was it was not did not exceed 14 percent of the total number of the displaced people because mostly the displaced people relied on their own savings and their own means to rent accommodation because of no government help or support. In other words, I did not uh, expect anything from the government by way of AIDS. So when we talk about 5.7 million displaced people and only 14% of them going to camps, uh, therefore most of the international aid went to the camps, then this means that the large percentage of displaced people remain outside the scope of any help, internally or externally. Uh, after 2014, the biggest wave of displaced people was in the Ambar government, and it reached 86% of the total population of the governorate. And in other words, those who were uh, officially registered and, and who did not register themselves, this means that the vast majority of the inhabitants of the Anbar province uh, became displaced, whether within the borders of the province itself or outside it, and Nineveh with, uh, comes second with 72%, Salah Din third with 47%, Diala 22%, Kirkuk 14%. The internal displacement within the same province was the largest, and sometimes reaching 52%, the large the, uh, secondly, the displaced people went to the uh, three uh, g g provinces of the Kurdish uh, region, Suleimani, Erbil, and Duhok. When we talk about 33% out of 5.7 million registered displaced, this means that uh, the Kurdish region has received uh, what amounts to half of its own population. And, uh, and this raises the question, why did they choose these provinces and not go to other provinces? Baghdad, being the capital and the biggest province, received only 10% of these internally displaced. And this started with the first wave of January 2014. Maybe you remember the incident of Zebes when the uh, displaced people from Ambar were not allowed to enter Baghdad and its next door. When ISIS uh, in May 2015 took control of Ramadi, around 70,000 people tried to reach Baghdad. They were not allowed, and after spending days out in the desert, they had to go to either the Kurdish region or other places within the same province. Five percent of the total number of displaced people went to the provinces with the Shiite majority population. When we say 5%, we will discover that 5% who went to Najaf, Karbala, uh, Babel, Wasit, Mutanna, Diqar, Misan, Al-Basra, the vast majority of them were from the governorate of Nineveh. 
either because they were Turkmen Shiites or Shabak Shiites. This means the identity element also uh, governed the situation. For this reason, when we try to discover the number of displaced people from Ambar to these uh, nine provinces, we will discover that uh, the percentage is not more than 2.9% of the total displaced people from the Ambar province. The geography of uh, these displaced uh, people linked or was a direct result of the identity conflict which was uh, overwhelming in Iraq and therefore the displaced persons had very limited choices in choosing where to go and the final issue I would like to allude to is the question of uh, the reconstruction and uh, until now, there is 1.6 million displaced people are still displaced, despite the fact that the military situation is much calmer and the security situation is much calmer after 2017. Yet the movement of these displaced people returning to their homelands is still linked to identity conflict. To start with, there were official orders or uh, de facto orders by the government not allowing them to reach. I'll take three examples. What happened in Jurf as sakhar there are still some 40,000 people from this area who are not officially allowed uh, b from the province of Babel to return to their areas. And this is an important issue. The, the second issue is what happened in Yathrib, in the Salah Ad-Din province, and uh, also Al Aziz Balad. The Yathrib population is around 78,000. The number of people returned is not more than 18,000 only. And those did not return until they had to sign a document called the Yathrib document. The conditions, first of all, the peoples, individuals, and tribes in the Yathrib region to pay blood money to those who were killed as a result of the, what happened in Balad. In other words, they were made to pay the blood money for what happened somewhere else in another town. And um, this, this totaled $1.6 million. And also the, the two towns of Yathrib and Balad, and the area separating them was declared a militarized zone which were not allowed uh, to be inhabited by people or used for agricultural purposes. And the, the, all the population of Yathrib should declare publicly their responsibility of what happened to the town of Balad. And this document was celebrated officially and publicly Despite that, uh, nobody was allowed to return. Until now, the percentage of people who returned was not more than 18,000 out of 78,000. The third example is what happened in Amerli, in the region of Suleiman Beg, whereby people were not allowed and uh, uh, even when the Council of Ministers decreed that they should return, the militias controlled this area and did not allow anyone to return. The other issue linked to the return of the displaced people is the reconstruction. Until now, the Iraqi government has not made any allocations of money available within the government's budget 
and they relied entirely on outside help. If you, if you look at the budgets of the Iraqi government from 2017 until now, you will find that the allocations to different uh, uh, governors uh, is not any different. It was always based on the number of population and the budgets did not take into account uh, what uh, these uh, cities have suffered from destruction. For example, uh, the, what happened in Mosul, what happened when 80 percent of the northern side of the city was destroyed. And when the government uh, solely relies on international aid, which is very limited, this, practically speaking, means that the displaced people will not be allowed to return because no one is going to help them to rebuild their houses or restore services, anything. When we talk about 1.8 still remaining, because they have not been able to return either because of the security measures or without any financial um, aid being allocated. The other important factor is we noticed in the last months that a second wave of displacement uh, started. Some of the villages where people have returned are beginning to return. And in the last six months, uh, ISIS has regained its activity and it's still forcing people to leave their homes. Thank you. My intervention also coincides with what uh, Mr. Yahya has mentioned. He focused generally on uh, displacement in Iraq, but I will speak specifically about the Yazidi minority in the disputed areas. I got the map to present to you the specific uh, disputed regions or areas that not many people may know. Because in Iraq, there are divisions and distributions where you see most Shias focused in the southern and the middle of Iraq and uh, Sunnis in the north and the middle, the Kurds in the far north in three provinces. Uh, the disputed areas are a dividing line between Arabs in the south, the Kurds in the north. Most religious and ethnic minorities are focused in these disputed areas. Why are they focused there? Of course, this has historical dimensions due to the religious pressure since the Ottoman era until the formation of the Iraqi state in the north and the south. Christians, Yazidis, Kakin, and Turkmen's uh, uh, moved to these areas and settled there. Now, the ethnic minorities in the disputed areas, the Turkmen's and the Shabak and the Kaikai, Kai. there's a dispute on their identity uh, for the last two, but the Turkmen's are uh, uh, clear, but and they uh, they are Shia, Shia and Sunnis. Now, for the religious minorities, the Yazidi and the Christians, and the Kai Kai is also cons or are also considered as part of a religion. But uh, there are people within that community that uh, considers themselves affiliated with Shia, but the majority consider themselves as a religion, as a, as a um, separate religion. Now, for the Yazidi uh, religion, it may not be well known in the Arab world. 
After the attacks of 2007 and what happened after that and in 2014, the media greatly focused on what uh, the Yazidis are going through, the massacres, uh, the operations uh, targeting them uh, uh, and conducted by extremist uh, Radic and radicals in uh, Iraq. The Yazidis have settled in Mesopotamia uh, way before the formation of the state of Iraq. Most of the Yazidis in the world live in Iraq, then Turkey, then Syria. Yeah, no more Yazidis in, are left in Iran. In Turkey, we uh, speak about 80,000 Yazidis. All of them have uh, migrated to Europe. Most of them are in Germany. And there are Yazidi diaspora in Georgia, Armenia, Ukraine, and former uh, uh, Soviet Union uh, states. There are no precise statistics on the Yazidis in or out of Iraq, but there are statistics amongst the Yazidis in uh, Germany. We speak about 220 to 230,000. If we subtract the 80,000 residing in Turkey, the rest will be in Syria and Iraq. The Yazidis of Iraq. You can't hear me? With the statistics on the Iraqi Yazidis, there are no accurate statistics. But the last one we had in Iraq was from 1997. The Ministry of Planning in Iraq relied on those statistics. And uh, there was a uh, uh, poll that happened, uh, with the exception of the Kurdistan of Iraq. With, this, uh, with the Gulf War in 1991, the Yazidis were divided between the Kurdish area and the central government area. Most of them were uh, under the central government uh, areas, and the other areas were part of the Kurdish area, and the UN resolution was issued to protect these area. The Iraqi Ministry of Planning until 15 of February 2003 spoke about around 281,000 uh, Yazidis approximately. These are the ones uh, in the region where this census, census happened. So if we uh, combine the other four areas where they are mainly focused, they may go uh, uh, to 300,000 until 2003. But now, as per the research that I have done with the organizations in, the, in Kurdistan, they uh, estimate them at 500 to 550,000. This is not the officially registered figure, but these are just estimates as per the demographic development and changes in Iraq. Now, if we speak about uh, the theoretical uh, aspect, the Yazidis historically have been under a lot of attacks and killings during the Ottoman area, uh, era. Sorry, We're talking about 72 uh, campaigns, as they put it, as the Yazidis put it, uh, uh, launched by the Ottomans. After the formation of the state of Iraq, most of them were integrated into the state, especially after the settlement of the Mosul area in 1925. Furthermore, they have faced a lot of problems with the new state. In 1925, there was a, a revolution uh, against both the Iraqi and the British authorities. And in 1935, uh, they rebelled in Sinjar for many reasons, including the Muslim tribal uh, settlement policy in Yazidi areas. The Yazidis uh, don't consider themselves as Muslims. They have their geographical uh, areas, uh, special regions. And we're talking about a rural community um, that highly depends on agriculture. In 1964, there was another uh, 
rebellion against the central government. These rebellions, as per the Iraqi literature, show that the central government of Iraq tried to impose uh, uh, military service. And my research showed that the leaders of the Yazidi rebellions or revolutions were always asking from getting their uh, territories back from the Arab tribal leaders that were implanted in those areas by the central government. The last of these rebellions was in 1964. It ended, and the Iraqi government was given a chance to draft new plans to control the Yazidis. Uh, in the 70s, many of their uh, Yazidi villages were destroyed, and they were gathered in what we can call as forced uh, groups or forced areas that they lived off farming and agriculture. Um, most of their villages were destroyed. They were gathered in uh, big compounds. And I've reviewed uh, the plans that uh, uh, focused on getting Arabs and Muslims around them. So this continued. And now the controversy continues about the identity, the issue of the identity. We're talking about an identity crisis and uh, uh, struggle in Iraq. The Yazidis uh, considered themselves as Arabs. Kurds are considered as part of the Kurdish ethnicity. But recently, there's a lot of changes regarding identity. And I've conducted a lot of research on the issue. And I think that the Yazidis are heading towards a new identity, which is an ethno-religious minority identity. So it's both a religion and an ethnicity. So uh, this is a theoretical approach of the Yazidis for you to understand. So we have two aspects, the theoretical and practical uh, part on displacement. Unlike Christians and Jews, we know that the Jews have left Iraq uh, totally. And around or until 2003, only eight to nine uh, Jewish households remained. The migration of Christians out of Iraq started in the 60s. Yazidis were uh, victims of internal displacement with the destruction of their villages in the uh, 60s until 2003 under the Ba'ath government. After 2001, their uh, migration uh, into Europe started. But after 2003, there were move, uh, waves of internal displacement, uh, non-Muslim minorities were being targeted by extremist and radical uh, religious groups, especially Al Qaeda, which has given a de uh, which has dealt a big blow to the Yazidis uh, in 2000 and until 2007. More than 800 uh, Yazidi citizens were killed and injured. So. They considered the 2007 campaign against them as a genocide. Many who were working in Baghdad and southern part of Iraq previously all moved to the Kurdish areas. In 2014, we know about the Daesh uh, or ISIS attack on Nineveh and Sanjar and Sainanoa, as well as Kirkuk. These are disputed areas. At the beginning of the attack, 100,000 Yazidis uh, moved to the mountain in Sinjar, knowing that it's a very protected area, that the mountain itself. The rest were able to flee through Syria uh, knowing that the Syrian Democratic Forces opened the channels uh, or the uh, areas for them. Back then, the SD, uh, SDF were called the PYG or the 
PYD or the YPG. So they opened a passageway through which the Yazidis uh, fled. We're talking about more than 10,000 Iraqi Yazidis and the Nauru's camp in Syria under the protection of the forces in the northern eastern part of Syria. The rest uh, reached the camps in the Kurdistan of uh, Iraq. There are 18 camps in Kurdistan for them, uh, most of them in the Hoq province under the Democratic um, Party, the Kurdish Democratic Party, and have conducted a practical uh, or a field uh, search about them. At the beginning of their displacement, 360,000 were registered. 360,000 Yazidi internally displaced people, IDPs in the camp. Three or four uh, days before I visited Doha, I uh, met uh, with the Dohok province uh, office for the registration of the IDPs, uh, they gave me a new figure that shows that the number of Yazidis in the 18 camps that I already mentioned were around 190,000. And I asked, where did the rest go? They said they either returned to Sinj back to Sinjar or they left to Iraq. They didn't know where they went. I think that around 80 to 90 percent of the Yazidis uh, migrated after 2014 to Germany and other European countries. And some European countries have been receiving uh, ESCDs and uh, providing them with asylum, especially the ones that were greatly persecuted and imprisoned by Daesh, ISIS. I think around 40 to 50,000 returned to Sinjar. After 2014, the balance of power change in disputed areas. For example, since 2003 and until 2014, the region is officially under the central government, but from a security perspective, it was controlled by the Kurdish Peshmergas and the security system that is the intelligence and security apparatuses. After the ISIS attacks, this security apparatus control was lost and the Iraqi army lost a lot of territories. After the loss of the uh, incurred by Daesh ISIS, uh, political Yazidi parties were formed and they also established uh, military factions. Before the ISIS uh, attack, only one Yazidi party was operational. Now it, it went up to three or four, most of which have uh, military factions or wings. For example, there's a military wing under the popular uh, mobilization forces, the Lalish uh, units. There are forces for the protection of Shinga or Sinjar that embraces uh, the ideology of the head of the PKK. Uh, sometimes they are accused of being part of the uh, Turkish uh, PKK, Abdullah or Jalan specifically. They say that we embrace the thinking and the doctrine of uh, or Jalan, but they are accused of being a wing of the PYD in Syria. There is another faction held by or led by Haidar Shoshu, the Izdikhan Protection Forces. Izdikhan is a historical name given to the areas where the Yazidis are anywhere. There are forces that are part of the Kurdish Peshmerga led by Qasim Shoshu. All these forces are warring or are uh, competing against one another. This in itself is a hindrance to the return of those uh, displaced to their areas of origin or uh, if there are households, families who wish to return, of course, this stands in their way. <coughs> the 
there are many factors uh, that hinder the return of the Yazidi displaced to Sanjar and other uh, disputed areas. Sinjar area and the houses therein are almost totally destroyed. This means that there are no services, no electricity, no water. How could the families return? There is no focus or interest by the different governments uh, to rebuild these areas, even though the ISIS uh, role has ended there. Another element is that during the ISIS attack, many of uh, the sons of the uh, Sunni tribes and other tribes as well uh, joined ISIS, even though they had good relations with the Yazidis before. But after ISIS uh, emerged, they joined them due to the religious indoctrination that happened in ISIS, which has affected the social fabric of the region. The Yazidi areas in Sinjar knowing that they're neighbors with those uh, Arab uh, tribe members. If those people are going to return, there's definitely going to be a lot of vendettas. So the area requires campaigns for uh, campaigns of solidarity, for rebuilding uh, the social fabric and solidarity. But there are no clear plans for the local, uh, regional, and the central governments to deal with this issue. There's a lot of uh, mines uh, in the different houses. We hear a lot of stories where explosions happen because of some mines that are left in the houses. So there should be uh, an anti-mine campaign. I wouldn't want to uh, uh, take more time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, it's difficult to distribute time fairly, but uh, we can blame it on the Yemen, perhaps, because they've taken the largest portion of time. We have a break. We have nine minutes before 11 to have some, uh, maybe you can make it 10 minutes into the break. And also, if you want to have tea or coffee, to not to deprive them of their right, please just state your name and make it a pointed question, not another lecture, please. Um, thank you, Dr. Hamid Al Hashimi. My comments on Yahya Al Kubais's paper. Uh, the title, in my opinion, I think uh, uh, he should have said. Uh, the sectarian conflict, not the identity conflict. Because by necessity, uh, the identity conflict can take a peaceful manifestation or a positive manifestation. If we're talking within the context of the sectarian, then we should take what, what uh, happened to it. Uh, to the Yazidis, because, or the Christians also in Mosul. So therefore, ignoring these two cases makes uh, the paper exclusively in the sectarian context. Uh, and I think uh, this is uh, a, a clever way of avoiding the sectarian aspect of it, but it is nonetheless evident. As for the other point, uh, 
And in order to avoid any misunderstanding in civil war situations, there is ethnic cleansing or sectarian cleansing. This is uh, accepted that the armed factions use the cleansing, whether ethnic or religious or whatever, uh, first of all, to harm the others and to secure their uh, situ situation or position. You said that uh, the victims among the Shias was, uh, was uh, the bigger, they had the lion's share of it as victims. Then you said the government colluded, so it is some kind of a war, and this is only to clarify the situation, and also in order not to misunderstand if the situation, I think the the identity conflict or the sectarian conflict was is not at the uh, popular level, because if that was true, then the Sunnis in Fao, Basra, Diwaniya, Zubair were mm, forced to leave because they still live there in peace. And also there were other Shias living in Sunni areas, in mixed areas in Diyala, Salah and others who were not uh, Im, uh, harmed by the Sunnis. So it's not at the popular level, but at the level of government and uh, uh, ide parties with ideologies. Question to Dr. Yahya. This, the blood monies, these were determined by the tribal rules. And uh, if, uh, if we uh, put it in the sectarian context, this happened in uh, in Sunni areas, then this was happening within the same sect uh, uh, because uh, some areas were, were also, some families were forced to leave. They were banished from their areas. And the final point is uh, maybe you forgot the in the 70s 1975 in the barzanis uh, uh, were forced out of their areas i remember in diwania large number of kurds were brought to our areas and they were made to live in in camps uh, we used to see them in the same area but they were not um, appearing in their national attire. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now we take uh, two questions from the right. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Fawaz Al Imad. Uh, this question of the Persian affiliation, can someone explain to us what do you mean by that? And can I add something, please, for Jorf Sakhar and Sulaiman Beg? Why can't the, 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 the people who are forced to leave their areas go back? My question to Dr. Ali. We think that the Yemeni crisis did not produce refugees, but only internally displaced persons. Is this due to the economic factors, due to poverty, for example? We know migration and displacement requires financial resources whether in the case of Iraqis or others, we will, we will see that by and large they belong to the middle classes. And also in the literature, we, it is mentioned that 
countries who export these uh, uh, refugees are not necessarily the poorest. Uh, the the a person who's classified as a poor person cannot be a refugee because he may not have the means. As for Dr. Yahya's presentation, I so he is mixing between displacement and uh, refugees and migrations. We know, according to the UN, the internally displaced persons remain within the borders of their countries. And uh, also, although there are some objections from the African Unity Organization, and uh, there are also uh, uh, refugees for political reasons. As for the title of this paper, don't you see that the real root cause of this conflict is political? But it was dressed up in a sectarian and an identity uh, complexion to be exploited for political reasons. And uh, in Iraq's modern history, there is no such thing as identity conflict. Are there questions or are there comments? I would like you to have uh, to mention also the the returning uh, s people also displaced people. Thank you. My question Abd Rabbi bin Sahra My question to Dr. Hassan about Darfur. After the Darfur peace agreement and the donors conference, which uh, supposedly five billion dollars were allocated, what was the impact of that on the displaced persons case in Darfur? Because this is important especially that uh, the the committee a committee was formed to work to implement these uh, solutions was there really an impact of these uh, efforts on the Darfur region the name of God. Your name, please. Dr. Faraj Hamouda from Libya. I want to pose a question to the two gentlemen from Iraq. They raised many points regarding the sectarian uh, uh, struggle in Iraq. I don't want to focus on the <coughs> displacement and uh, refugee side of things. Uh, my question is, are there any uh, initiatives to limit this sectarian struggle which uh, started in 2003 until now, and now it's more or less a, an endless uh, conflict? So the question is, why can't there be national reconciliation in Iraq to put an end to this bloodshed? And is this conflict fed from inside the country or outside it? We do not want to focus on settlement and migration. We want to discuss the root causes I, and why aren't there any local initiatives to put an end to this conflict. As for uh, displacement and suffering, these are consequences of the state of division and the internal strife uh, and Shia-Sunni divide. Why can't there be some sort of a social reconciliation? 
Thank you. Dr. Omar Rafi from Al Jazeera. Three questions to Dr. Hassan Haj Ali. How, what is the approach by the new authorities in Sudan towards the Darfur question? Uh, Dr. Ihal Kubaisi, are there Shia refugees in Iran? And Dr. Majid Hassan Ali, according to the international law, we uh, recognize each group as how they describe themselves or identify themselves. So how do Yazidis identify themselves? <coughs> Samir Bakush, my question to Dr. Musa. It is known that uh, regional uh, governments uh, try to politically manipulate figures. Was there any regional influence uh, so far as the NGOs are there? Some of the some of them became uh, political actors acting upon instructions from regional governments. All the questions are from men. We, we want to take care of gender issues too. Okay, therefore we Abdul Wahab al Fendi from the center. My question to Dr. Hassan. So far as the statistics you presented on the return of uh, displaced people, it seems that they are bigger than the numbers of the displaced people themselves. Secondly, Yabdu, this happened in 2019, as it seems, at a time when there was a revolution in Sudan. Is there any relations between the two? Any relationship between the two issues? And my question to Dr. Yahya is uh, the government's policy towards uh, displaced pe people in Sudan, there was also a reliance on the NGOs and international organizations. Was the situation in Iraq the same? Dr. Munir from Algeria. Uh, my question is on the Sudan in particular. Can you speak up, please? These camps for displaced people and refugees, is, is this uh, linguistically acceptable or is there any political connotations? And also, why is it that in the Sudani case in particular, these uh, displaced people did not seek accommodation in cities? Thank you very much, Doctor. I didn't see you, sorry. Salam alaikum. My name is Nada. This is uh, a very saddening issue really, no matter how you look at it, but nonetheless we have to be optimistic. I just want to make an addition. I thank Dr. Hassan, which had a lot of information, but he mentioned that the situation has impacted the Sudan as uh, an as a whole, but also the examples he gave were 
pertained to the, the region of Darfur and the adjacent regions like Kordofa. Also, the people inside Sudan are displaced people, they are not refugees, because the, refug the word refugee involves rights also. And uh, most of the provinces which in the peripheries uh, um, suffered from the lack of basic uh, services and they're mostly people who live in the rural areas and uh, they raise cattle and uh, they did not receive much of help by way of education health services. Thank you very much. Yes, for Darfur, Dr. Hassan. Now there is the the numbers between the total number of displaced people and the people who returned. I give you the opportunity now to respond. Thank you very much. And rather briefly, I will say the impact of the Doha agreement on the displacement. The agreement had a huge impact because these villages of return, they were not present in the past. I uh, mentioned that and mentioned the number of people who returned to them. The problem in the statistics uh, according to December 2018 figures, the number of displaced was 1.8 million people. The number for the 10, 1.4 million. But uh, because this figure uh, uh, keeps changing and fluctuating, Sometimes the conflict quietens down, so the figures go down, but other people from other areas uh, become displaced. Uh, I said maybe the average is around 2 million, with give or take. Uh, 2002, 2003 reached the maximum height, and then it went down. So therefore, these statistics uh, uh, vary and fluctuate. The transitional uh, authority ended in 2016, but uh, a decree was issued to um, mandate the return commission to to continue the work because there were some positive aspects and to provide the infrastructure like schools and uh, hospitals and the Doha agreement uh, contributed positively to this. What is the role of the new authorities? Now we are witnessing uh, the first round of peace talks in Juba in South Sudan and we hope that in December there will be a second round with the armed functions in the different parts of Sudan, except one faction which is still reluctant to recognize the new government and enter into peace talks. Using the word of camp and groupings or because the word camp means is, is a center for refugees which is recognized internationally and uh, nationally, but there are groups of uh, displaced people which is either of a temporary nature or which are not uh, uh, recognized by OCHA or other organizations. Dr. Kubay is saying camp means uh, like a, not necessarily a military camp, but can be used in the civil civilian sense. Also, the most of or if not all of these camps are established in the outskirts of cities. For example, the biggest one, As Salam or Zamzam, or which are 
you know these things they're around uh, t two kilometers away from the city they more or less have become extensions of Niala or Al Fashar towns and cities as for what uh, Nada said I uh, did not really understand the significance of her comment. Uh, is it uh, related to uh, uh, refugees or uh, displaced people? Uh, I'm not sure whether the questioner meant that the person who, who uh, takes, seeks refuge abroad knows his rights. I don't know. We cannot hear the lady because she's not using a microphone. We could not hear what the lady said, but uh, the Dr. Hassad is, says that now there is 200,000 refugees in Chad who know almost nothing about their rights, really. Thousands of them went to Kenya, Ethiopia, and they did not have and in means or resources, they used to walk to these neighboring countries. Also, we did not hear what the lady said, but uh, Dr. Hassan is saying this is not accurate because most of the refugees do not know their rights, they have no alternatives, but they, according or because of different elements, either went to cities and urban communities or others chose to go to neighboring countries. Thousands of them walked to Kenya, Uganda and Ethiopia. They could have gone to the north, but so this is not accurate anyway. identity struggle. The paper doesn't also speak about uh, the displacement of minority, the, the impact of the Kurdish conflict on the Kirkuk area specifically. It didn't only focus on the sectarian aspect. We spoke about the conflict of identities or the struggle of identities in general in Iraq. The example I uh, spoke about in Yathrib. Also, the paper speaks about uh, two other examples, Salah al and the Ambar, because there was also a signing of a uh, paper, uh, the paper of the honor of the Code of Conduct, I think, uh, It has prevented the return of many who were affiliated with ISIS, but this is a part of a tribal conflict. There is no tribe in Iraq. Uh, with the sons uh, when affiliated with ISIS, but the weak uh, tribe were the ones to bear the sanction or the punishment of the so Nobody touched the big ones. But also the tribal conflict, the tribal struggle, is part of the struggle over the resources. The Jokes that suffer uh, right of return, we see that all of the land are very rich uh, agriculturally thanks to the abundance of water. This is also a struggle and uh, a struggle on uh, resources, but in a sectarian aspect. This is mentioned in the But the time did not allow us to enter into the details. Now, the issue of the dia. When we speak of all the dias, this was also part of this power struggle. So it's part of imposing or dictating the, uh, one's will. There were also compensations with agricultural lands. So dia means blood money. So this is a compensation with agricultural lands. So that is part of the power. King? We didn't hear the comment. We are talking about how the struggle for resources uh, uh, shows in a sectarian uh, manner.
Yes, in Anbar, there's no sectarian manner. It, it, it looks like a tribal uh, struggle. Now for the Persian affiliation. The 1925 law for the Iraqi nationality has categorized uh, or given give different categories to give the national to the passport. Every Iraqi were, uh, that bore a, an Ottoman paper was given a uh, not uh, the nationality of the passport with the Ottoman affiliation. A lot of Iraqis are not Persians, are not Iranians. They are Arabs, but they would go to get uh, Persian nationality to avoid the military service. So those were given the Persian affiliation. So it's like they bore Persian papers even before the formation of the state of Iraq. This is also a categorization and the nationality law. It was also another uh, controversy historically, and the British contributed to that because they were the ones to have drafted the law, of course, so the real drafters or legislators here. I said that after 2014, we reached 5.7 millions and having 1.8 millions means that more than 4 millions have returned 4.2 millions have returned this is in the paper but i was focusing on the reasons why the others haven't returned they d were displaced but weren't able to return why <coughs> the number of those returned has exceeded 4.2 millions starting with the end of 2016 until now the last question. Now, for the national reconciliation issue. This was an issue that was greatly raised in Iraq. There were a lot of uh, things that happened, a lot of discussions, a lot of papers. But I think the Iraqi political uh, class is benefiting a lot from the continuation of the sectarian struggle. The changes on the ground may push them to change their behavior. This became, uh, remains a bet that we have, of course. But practically speaking, all the attempts of national reconciliation have failed miserably because there was no real wish for uh, national reconciliation. Another question related to the figures and numbers. The Iranians are not only Shia. We're speaking about the Iraqi uh, refugees in Iran. The highest number was in 1990. It reached 961,641, uh, 961, most of which are Kurds. This number includes the Kurds of Failia that were displaced from Iraq, the Kurds that were displaced, and a number of Shias that left after the Intifada, 1991 Intifada, and they had to go to Iran. This number dropped in 2002 520,000. It means that more than half a million were Kurds. Because of the situation in Kurdistan after 1991, they left to Kurdistan. Now, another figure. In October 2019, the number of uh, Iraqi refugees in Iran is 28,268 only. Another question. I said that the Iraqi government uh, during the two uh, displacement uh, waves in 2006 and 2014 didn't have any wish, any will to support them financially, support the dis IDPs financially. This is clear. If we review the figures of the Iraqi budget. If we speak in 2006 about the IDPs reaching around 1.8 million, in 2007 there were only 800,000. This is the question. The external support, specifically after 2014, exceeded the support by the state uh, greatly. For example, the Saudi contribution 2014 was $500 million much more than what the Iraq has uh, had allocated for that. The USAID support 
paid for the four to five uh, years around million or two billion dollars if we've heard right so the international support uh, was the one to fund the the refuge uh, the IDPs and not the Iraqi government I don't have many questions even though Yemen is uh, greatly forgotten the first question on migration for the Yemeni refugees. I think that the Syrian refugees have broken the taboo or have broken the issue that says that the middle class mostly uh, migrates. But if you look at the Syrians, you see that also the poor have uh, migrated to Europe in millions. Now for Yemen. Yemen also overlooks the sea at 2,000 kilometers, and I think now it is a, uh, an imprisoned state from all sides. If uh, borders were open with Saudi Arabia, with Oman, you would find millions of Yemenis there. So Yemen is in a big prison. It has the sea behind it, and you have the borders, the conflict uh, on the other side. The media doesn't greatly focus on Yemen. So the country is totally forgotten. And suffers a great humanitarian crisis. If we have around 450,000 Yemenis abroad, the latest statistics, of course, the accurate statistics are lacking. But most of them are in Somalia, through the sea, in Egypt, and some regional uh, countries such as Turkey and others. <coughs> in the European countries, most of them uh, used to work with international uh, organizations worked in their projects. They migrated in order to work on certain projects and stayed in Europe. Some were also preparing to study, to pursue their studies. We're talking about 10 to 12,000 Yemeni refugees outside the geographical uh, scope. To answer your question, unfortunately, uh, the Yemen is a uh, a state that is in a great prison, and this is something that we have to greatly highlight. I hope things are starting uh, to be shaken. Now, for the organizations that uh, follow the regional conflict, they established NGOs, CSOs, and also military wings. So uh, proxy wars in Yemen have become uh, very random. No longer are they organized. You see that an army fighting with you, but at the same time, they stand against your own allies. So there are a lot of issues. be it Iran, UAE, Saudi Arabia, they have local armies, and this is why a lot of uh, organizations were established. So they established CSOs and NGOs for that, so that every regional party to brag about sending financial and humanitarian aid knowing that they dispatch this aid through agencies that are part of the struggle and that they have established themselves. The UAE, for example, supports the uh, forces in the south. Iran supports certain uh, parties. At the end, it became uh, such a random uh, situation. We no longer know who's our enemy, who's our friend, who's our uh, enemy's enemy, who's our enemy's friend. We, as Yemeni people. Now, for the short term, I don't think the Yemeni crisis or a, a war will not be easily resolved. Now, well, I was asked how the Yazidis perceive themselves. <coughs> the UN uh, defined them as uh, 
part of a uh, religious group that was greatly uh, persecuted by the ISIS. ISIS didn't uh, target them uh, randomly. It was due to a specific uh, reason. Many authors and Arab writers since the 20s to the 70s considered uh, them as uh, Satan worshippers, uh, uh, followers of Zaradasht, uh, Zarazustra or Christians, and uh, they, they didn't express themselves until the 70s. Why? Because they were uh, never schooled uh, in the Ottoman era. The schools were military, and there was a con continuous conflict with the o Ottoman Empire. After the establishment of the new, uh, new school, Sayyid started learning and getting educated, and the new generation emerged in the 70s and they started writing articles. Of course, the official uh, Iraqi government considered them as a uh, Umawi uh, group, but they didn't try to Islamize them or try to change their religion. That's officially after the 70s. They started writing about, about themselves and in the 90s. <coughs> With the great technological advancement and their entry and enrollment in universities, they started expressing themselves, saying that they are an independent religion. It's not a part of Zarathustra, Christianity, or Islam. Now, the Yazidis have an internal uh, identity struggle. Religiously, there's no controversy, but the controversy is the related to identity. Are they Arabs, Kurds, or a different ethnicity? It's They are uh, through uh, uh, undergoing a transformation. There are Yazidis that are related to the national parties and consider themselves as Kurds. And until 2003, there was a number of Yazidis, especially part of the Emiri uh, uh, family because there is a certain uh, religious uh, structure and hierarchy. There was a wing of the f royal uh, family considering themselves as uh, Arabs, but after 2003, they changed. There are parties inside the Yazidis and trends inside the Yazidis that consider themselves as an ethnicity and a religion. They're not Arabs, they're not Kurds in their perception. So these transformations are going to be defined by the future. Also, outside of Iraq, there are Yazidis that are affected by the Kurdish parties in Turkey and Syria, consider themselves as a part of the Kurdish uh, ethnicity. The Yazidis of Armenia and Georgia and former uh, USSR consider themselves as uh, both a religion and an ethnicity and don't consider themselves as linked to the aforementioned ethnicities. Thank you. Thank you so much, the speakers, the participants. Eleven forty-five. A fifty-minute break.